On what should have been a routine training flight, a small Piper Tomahawk lifted off with two experienced aviators on board. 70-year-old David Rotman of Lanoke County and 44-year-old Lucas Parker of Conway never made it back. There was no distress call, no report of an engine failure, no obvious emergency unfolding over the radio. From the outside, nothing about this flight suggested it was heading toward disaster. So that raises a difficult question. How does a familiar airplane, flown by a capable crew, depart on an ordinary instructional flight and then slowly unravel without either pilot fully understanding what is happening? To answer that, we need to walk through this accident carefully, not dramatically, not emotionally, but step by step, following the same path the investigators did and paying close attention to the quiet details that matter most. The aircraft involved was a Piper PA-38-112 Tomahawk, a simple two-seat training airplane designed specifically for instructional flying. It is not fast, it is not complex, and in the right conditions it is very predictable. That predictability is exactly why it's commonly used for flight training. On this day, the flight was planned as a routine instructional sortie. Nothing in the weather stood out as a concern. There were no reports of turbulence icing, or reduced visibility. Fuel was not an issue, and there was no indication of a pre-existing engine problem. From the crew's perspective, this was a normal day at the airport. The Tomahawk departed as expected. The engine was producing power. The airplane climbed away from the runway. At first glance, everything appeared to be functioning normally. This is important because accidents often begin with something clearly abnormal a warning light, a loud noise, or a sudden loss of power. That didn't happen here. Instead, the earliest signs of trouble were subtle. As the flight continued, radar data showed that the airplane's path began to deviate from what you would expect during a normal training climb. The track was not smooth. Altitude changes became inconsistent. Turns appeared uncoordinated. None of this suggests an aircraft that is suddenly unflyable. Rather, it suggests an airplane that is being flown by someone who is no longer managing it precisely. So what might a pilot think at this stage? At this point, it's reasonable to assume the crew believed they were dealing with a minor issue, perhaps a handling anomaly, perhaps a momentary distraction, nothing that would immediately justify declaring an emergency. That's often how these situations begin. When a problem does not clearly announce itself, the brain tries to fit what's happening into familiar categories. Pilots are trained to troubleshoot obvious failures, but when the airplane is still producing power, still responding to control inputs, and still in the air, the sense of urgency is often lower. As the flight progressed, control inputs became increasingly erratic. The airplane's altitude fluctuated, its ground track wandered. These are not the hallmarks of a mechanical failure like a jammed control or a total engine loss. Instead, they point towards something affecting the crew's ability to manage the airplane consistently. And yet, from the outside, the airplane was still flying. There was no mayday call, no clear radio transmission indicating the pilots understood they were in serious trouble. That absence is a clue in itself. When pilots recognize a sudden emergency, they usually say something. The silence here suggests that the crew may not have fully grasped the nature of the problem unfolding. Eventually, the airplane lost control and impacted terrain. The flight ended not with a dramatic mechanical break, but with a gradual loss of effective aircraft control. At this stage, investigators faced a familiar but challenging task. The weather was not the cause. Fuel was available. The engine showed no evidence of a power-producing failure prior to impact. So if the airplane could fly, why wasn't it being flown successfully? To answer that, investigators had to look somewhere less obvious, not at the wings, not at the engine's ability to produce thrust, but at what was happening inside the cabin. When investigators examined the wreckage, they found something that immediately changed the direction of the investigation. The exhaust system showed a cracked muffler. On a piston aircraft, like the Tomahawk, the exhaust system sits very close to the cabin heating system. 
Cabin heat is produced by routing air around parts of the exhaust, allowing it to warm before entering the cockpit. That design works well until exhaust gases escape where they shouldn't. A crack in the muffler creates a pathway. Exhaust gases, including carbon monoxide, can be drawn into the cabin through the heating system. Importantly, this doesn't require the engine to fail, and it doesn't necessarily produce any obvious external signs. Carbon monoxide is colorless, odorless, and tasteless. There is no sensory warning that it's present, but physical evidence alone isn't enough to establish cause. Investigators also look to toxicology, because that tells them what the crew was experiencing physiologically. In this case, toxicology results revealed elevated levels of carboxyhemoglobin in the pilot's blood. Carboxyhemoglobin forms when carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin, the molecule responsible for carrying oxygen in the bloodstream. This finding is critical. It confirms that carbon monoxide was not just present in the aircraft, it was entering the pilot's bodies in meaningful amounts. Now here's an important point. The levels found were not consistent with instant incapacitation. This was not a scenario where the pilots would suddenly lose consciousness without warning. Instead, these levels indicate progressive impairment. That distinction matters. Carbon monoxide exposure often unfolds slowly. Judgment degrades, coordination suffers, attention narrows, and the person affected may not realize that anything is wrong. They are breathing normally. The engine sounds normal. The airplane is still flying. So the brain assumes everything is fine, even as performance quietly declines. This explains something that puzzled investigators early on. Why there was no mayday call. Why the airplane remained airborne for a period of time while control quality steadily worsened. And why the flight profile looked confused rather than catastrophic. The airplane was still flyable. The engine was still producing power. The control surfaces were still connected, but the crew was being silently disabled. At this stage of the investigation, a clearer picture began to emerge. The cracked exhaust muffler provided the source. The cabin heat system provided the pathway. And the toxicology results confirmed the effect. The remaining question was not whether carbon monoxide played a role, but how its specific physiological effects translated into the flight behavior we saw on radar. And that's where understanding how carbon monoxide affects pilots becomes essential. To understand how this accident unfolded, it helps to step away from the wreckage for a moment and focus on what carbon monoxide actually does to the human body, especially in a cockpit environment. Carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin far more readily than oxygen does. When that happens, the blood's ability to carry oxygen is reduced, even though the person continues to breathe normally. From the outside, nothing appears wrong. Inside the brain, however, oxygen delivery is quietly falling. This is where carbon monoxide becomes especially dangerous for pilots. It doesn't create the sensation of suffocation. There is no urgent feeling of air hunger that forces a response. Instead, symptoms tend to develop gradually. A mild headache, a sense of pressure, subtle confusion, or difficulty concentrating. These are sensations many pilots have experienced before for entirely benign reasons, such as fatigue or dehydration. So how does a pilot react to that? Most of the time they don't, at least not immediately. The brain attempts to compensate. Tasks take slightly longer. Control inputs become less precise. Decision making narrows. The pilot may still believe they are functioning normally, even as performance declines. In this accident, that gradual impairment helps explain the flight profile investigators observed. The aircraft did not suddenly depart controlled flight. Instead, it showed increasing difficulty maintaining altitude and direction. Control corrections became inconsistent. This is exactly what you would expect when a pilot is still conscious, still engaged, but no longer processing information accurately. At the same time, carbon monoxide affects situational awareness. A pilot may struggle to interpret what the airplane is doing, or misjudge how serious a deviation really is. That makes effective troubleshooting almost impossible. If you don't realize you're impaired, you don't take the steps needed to protect yourself. This pattern appears repeatedly in general aviation accidents involving carbon monoxide. The airplane continues flying. The engine sounds normal. 
The crew attempts to manage what they believe is a minor issue until control is finally lost. And that leads to a difficult question. If a pilot doesn't recognize their own impairment, what chance do they have to intervene in time? At first glance, it might be tempting to assume that this accident was simply the result of a missed defect, but that explanation is incomplete. Exhaust systems on piston aircraft operate in harsh conditions. Over time, cracks can develop, particularly in areas that are difficult to see without removing surrounding components. In many training aircraft, the exhaust muffler sits beneath a shroud. That shroud is necessary for cabin heat, but it also hides the very area where cracks are most likely to form. If the shroud is not removed during inspection, a developing crack may remain invisible. This is where the concept of the maintenance trap comes in. An aircraft can pass an annual or 100-hour inspection while still carrying a serious risk. The system may technically meet inspection requirements, yet remain unsafe in real-world operation. Compliance does not always guarantee protection. Investigators have noted that a number of carbon monoxide-related accidents occur shortly after inspections. That doesn't mean inspections are ineffective. It means that certain hazards are particularly easy to miss unless they are actively sought out. In this case, the cracked muffler was not an obvious external failure. It did not cause a loss of engine power. It did not announce itself with noise or vibration. But once cabin heat was selected, it allowed exhaust gases to enter the cockpit environment. The NTSB has repeatedly emphasized the importance of thorough exhaust inspections, including removal of shrouds when necessary. This accident reinforces why that guidance exists. Without direct visual access, some of the most dangerous failures remain hidden. The lesson here is uncomfortable, but important. An airplane can be legally airworthy and still carry a latent risk that only becomes apparent in flight. And once that risk begins affecting the crew, there may be very little time to respond. When engineering controls and maintenance defenses fail, what remains is detection. For years, carbon monoxide detection in light aircraft relied heavily on passive indicators, small cards or spots that change color in the presence of CO. These devices are inexpensive and simple, but they have a critical limitation. They require the pilot to notice the change and interpret it correctly. In an accident like this one, that limitation matters. Carbon monoxide impairs the very skills needed to recognize danger. By the time a passive indicator changes color, the pilot's ability to respond may already be compromised. That's why the NTSB has strongly recommended the use of active carbon monoxide detectors with audible and visual alerts. These devices do not rely on the pilot noticing something subtle. They actively interrupt the cockpit environment, forcing attention at a stage when meaningful action is still possible. An early alert could have changed the crew's options. Ventilation could have been increased, cabin heat turned off an immediate landing initiated while cognitive function was still largely intact. None of these actions require perfect flying, just timely recognition. Looking back at this accident, it becomes clear that it was not the result of a single failure. It was a chain, a hidden maintenance vulnerability, undetected carbon monoxide entering the cabin, gradual human impairment, and finally loss of control. David Rotman and Lucas Parker were not inexperienced pilots making reckless decisions. There is no indication they knowingly accepted unnecessary risk. What they encountered was an invisible hazard that eroded their ability to respond without ever clearly revealing itself. This accident reminds us of something aviation teaches repeatedly. Safety margins are rarely destroyed all at once. They are quietly worn away, one small factor at a time and some of the most serious threats in aviation are not the ones we can see or hear, but the ones we don't notice.